All right, welcome back to another After Dark, everyone. Um, time to talk about David Robinson. Uh, we're going to check out a video from a channel called Thinking Basketball. And this is part of uh, their series uh, called Greatest Peaks. So this is episode seven of that series. And this is called The Forgotten Megastar of the 90s. And this is about David Robinson. Uh, somebody in, uh, in the comment section recently reminded me, like, what about David Robinson? And that was enough. I was like, holy crap, I can't believe I haven't talked about one of my all-time favorite centers and one of my favorite players of the 90s. Um, in my opinion, before there was Shaq, this was the strongest dude I've ever seen play basketball. Military man, strong, just ripped and just absolutely tough, quick on his feet, hell of a defender, hell of an offensive player, high shot release, like David Robinson had it all. So we're going to check this out. Uh, it's a 21 minute video, so kick back, grab a drink, relax a little bit. Um, as always, I'm going to link the original video down below in the description if you want to watch it without my commentary. Everybody else, please leave this video a like. I appreciate it every time, and it really does help a lot. Um, but yeah, let's watch this together. Here we go. Basketball Adonis David Robinson generated some of the best regular season numbers in league history. He and Michael Jordan are the only players ever Ooh. to win a scoring title and defensive player of the year. Damn, man, good block by David Robinson. <laughs> Jordan just went right at him. But was he just a paper tiger? Did he crumble in the playoffs? Mm -mm. Or was he actually a complex, multifaceted superstar and one of the most valuable players of the three-point era? You are watching what greatness is all about. Where's Larry Bird in all this? Has it blocked by Elijah Ross? Michael Jordan <laughs> saves the day. This series tackles one question. Who was the best at his best? We start at the ABA merger and go through the best multi-year stretches, examining the legends who provided the most on-court impact. These are the greatest peaks. Cool series. If you guys end up liking this, I definitely want to check out the rest of them. So yeah, real quick, just in case you didn't catch it, this is about the greatest peaks. So this is David Robinson from 1994 to 1996. Not talking about the greatest of all time. We're just talking about the greatest peaks at the top of their game. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand that he's very special. It's ghostly. Uh, it's not recognizable. You think of it as normal quickness, but I think it, it transcends that, goes to another level. In the 80s, we saw some of the greatest offensive players to ever grace the hardwood. But Robinson was a callback to defensively dominant big men like Bill Russell. In college, David's quick leaping drew comparisons to Russell. It took a millisecond for him to reach 11 feet with a quick hop and his long outstretched left hand. Listed at 7'1", Robinson was a good two or three inches taller than Russell, and his combination of size and jumping speed made him a devastating rim protector. NASA should have conducted lab testing on how quickly Robinson launched off the floor. All he required was a little knee bend to spring up off of two feet. He does look like Bill Russell a little bit with that quick, that quick jump and long stretch. And he was almost entirely a two-footed jumper, often using a quick hop to organize his feet and then swat. Yeah. Here's another look. There's the little hop to load up and he's still on the floor when Wayman Tisdale nears his apex, and in less than two tenths of a second, Robinson arrives above the rim. Oh, that's really quick. It typically took Robinson about six or seven tenths of a second from the time he started his gather to meet the ball above the hoop. For comparison, this crazy Michael Jordan block took over eight tenths from his windup, and when Robinson went directly into his bunny hop to contest, he was comparable to Russell himself in time to reach 10 feet. Yeah, that does look very, very similar. Throw in Robinson's length, and he could just materialize out of nowhere like a shot-blocking wraith. On the offensive end, Robinson can feel unspectacular, 
his upper nice body stiffness jam. lacks a certain sexiness for most people, but that's because he was a seven foot one bionic human whose best move was just being quicker and more explosive than normal big men. Yeah, and it was, he looked at like this posture was so stiff because he's just ripped at a core. He's just muscles on top of muscles. Despite his height, he preferred to turn and face the hoop from the mid range and go to work out of a classic triple threat position. His first step was overwhelming for most opponents, and he was strong enough to power around slight contact like this. Even though it's only one hard dribble, he was a boatload approaching the basket with a short runway. This face jab and go game was too fast for many fives of the 1990s, and it led to a parade to the free throw line. Robinson's free throw rates peaked right around Jordan's during their best playoff stretches, despite David having the ball less than MJ and not receiving deliberate fouls like Shaq and Dwight Howard. Damn. As you can see from that list, it's hard for big men to create signature shots when marching to the free throw line constantly. But as a 75% free throw shooter, this was incredibly effective offense. He even threw in his own mini Euro step where he'd swing back the other way if he felt his first step cut off. They didn't call this pivot foot travel as much back then, even though they were stricter in forcing two steps. In a sense, his physical gifts made Robinson the 90s version of Giannis Antetokounmpo, except instead of attacking from around the three-point line, Robinson set up shop near the elbows and relied on a quick first step. Similar, um, just David Robinson was taller. Um, Giannis can dribble a little better, but I would say 100% Dave Robinson is a better defender, and he's also just stronger. And he also has that high-release jumper, man, which you haven't shown Unlike yet. Unlike Giannis, the Admiral blended his rim attacks with an effective face-up jumper. There it is. Look at that high-release. He could fake a drive with that jab step to create space, then fire a clean look. In the data we have access to at the end of the 90s, Robinson hit 43 to 44 percent. Look at that. Look at that high release of his mid range twos, landing him somewhere between the 60th and 75th percentile among volume mid range shooters this century. And he could even drain those off a dribble, although he appeared less comfortable moving into his shots like this. His outside shot then allowed him to sell up fakes and beeline to the rim and that resulted in more layups or trips back to the free throw line. He looks a lot like Hakeem Olajuwon when he does that move. Back in those days, he was occasionally criticized for playing like this, seen merely as a jump shooter who lacked the traditional back to the basket game to dominate like a classic big. But remember, back to the basket offense isn't incredibly effective unto itself. Kareem was basically the only big man to spearhead great offenses for the first 35 or 40 years of the shot clock, and he did so next to elite guards. Yep, unless your name is Charles Barkley, Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, or uh, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Yeah, not too many people are good in that post with the back to the basket. Besides, too. Robinson did have a solid low post game, too. His physical advantages allowed him to power into certain opponents, and once again, that pressure led to quality looks at the rim or more free throws. He also had a nice little fadeaway to his left shoulder, and he could flow into this quickly, and his size and high release often generated a really clean look. By 1995, this shot was fairly polished, and he used it quite a bit against smaller defenders who gave him problems like Karl Malone. Malone's bodybuilding strength and quick feet prevented Robinson from blasting by him. Good lord. And he could hold Yeah, that's <laughs> that's a good matchup between these two because they're both just just solid muscle. And not like the modern muscle, like this was like strength backed muscle. Deep position against David and disrupt his setups despite giving up four inches or so. Agility and strength were an antidote to Robinson's first step. And once a drive was walled up, he could target the ball with that patented slapdown move. Yep. And in today's jargon, he would be an admiral stopper. In general, bigs who were fairly strong and could move their feet well slowed Robinson down by taking away the quickness advantage he held over so many traditional centers of the 90s. David could occasionally turn back to that right shoulder, 
but this was a tougher shot for him. He doesn't rotate that quickly, mm -hmm. and so squaring his shoulders to the hoop takes an extra, sometimes awkward beat. Yeah, it looks like it. If you wanna, if you wanna beat him, make him make him put his back to the basket, and if he's fronting you. You got to be somebody quick enough on your feet, like like they showed Dennis Rodman doing, where you can get to where he's going to go before he gets there, and then you can slap down on that shot because he starts it like mid mid body. Cool breakdown. Against weaker defensive teams of his era, Robinson was less likely to encounter matchups like this, but his scoring took a major haircut against stronger defensive teams who were more likely to have versatile big men. That 6% drop in efficiency is on the large side for modern superstars, and in the regular season, Robinson was able to juice his scoring numbers a bit more than a typical star player by picking on weaker teams, which meant that his peak regular season numbers overstated how effective his scoring arsenal was in a playoff setting. Now, this is still good scoring, it's just not great scoring. The Admiral even threw in a little spin move occasionally, but this was also stiffer than versions from other superstars at the time, like Hakeem Olajuwon. Yeah. Even Robinson's really impressive shots, like this turn over Olajuwon, didn't leave the same mark as Hakeem's crazy high difficult fadeaways, and this aesthetic gap helped create the impression that Olajuwon dominated Robinson and was light years ahead of him as a player. Now, he just looked way smoother. There is there is no big man that looked smoother, especially in the post, than um, Hakeem Olajuwon. There's, just, there's never been one. But that narrative misses a critical part of the story and overlooks Robinson's actual value on a high-level team. Dennis, you're just a little bit too tight, man. You need to loosen up. Over the top, man. Be an individual. <laughs> so what do you want me to do? Well, you can start by eating your pizza the wrong way. Crust first. Oh, my God. Do you remember this? you remember this? This was the dumbest thing to me. We're supposed to eat it crust first. What do you hold on to? Look at him. <laughs> he's got he's to gotta just lift up the limp end of the, of the slice. This was so stupid to me. This whole movement. Oh, is this Pizza Hut? It's got to be Pizza Hut. They're the only ones doing this kind of crazy shit. After a number of near wins, Robinson finally grabbed an MVP trophy in 1995 and led the Spurs to the Western Finals, where he ran into a buzzsaw. Robinson was tasked with guarding Hakeem, often without any help, and while he defended him fairly well on most possessions, a heads-up battle with Hakeem was a bad matchup for the Admiral. Olajuwon had some monster games mm -hmm. in their regular season meetings, and Akeem's quickness could take away Robinson's first step, while on the other end, Robinson couldn't really take away his dream-shaking and wild shot-making. Robinson was a really good man defender. He used his length to contest shots well, and he was able to hold his own against the powerful brutes of that era, grappling with a young Shaquille O'Neal here before his quickness wins out for the steal. Nice. Even though he wasn't great moving laterally, he was long and springy enough to recover, but he was susceptible to up fakes, and at times he could be a little too quick off his feet, which showed in a number of different defensive scenarios, especially near the hoop. Jumping like this fed into Hakeem's hands as a ball faking Houdini, yeah, yeah, it did. throwing his dream shakes into Robinson and setting him up for memorable scoring highlights. Combine Olajuwon's tough shot making and his own natural quickness, and it makes for a lopsided game of one-on-one. -on -one. But that's the thing about Robinson. He's a good one-on-one -on -one player, but he's a five-on-five -five star. His off-ball game was just as, if not more important than his isolation scoring. His face-up jumper made him a viable catch-and-shoot finisher in the mid-range, but more importantly, it made him a pick and pop weapon. This wasn't the spread pick and roll that is so popular today, but the Spurs ran- Where was Shaq on that play? Who are you guarding? You guarding him? Yeah, you are. This wasn't the spread pick and roll that is so popular today, but the Spurs ran plenty of ball screens inside the three point arc where Robinson could pop to open space and knock down positive value shots. 
by 1994, this shot was pretty dialed in for David, and he could even turn it into an upfake and go in these situations. His athletic gifts also made him a natural finisher around the basket. This play against the Rockets shows just how easy he could make it look, catching the ball 10 feet away, and casually gliding by a fleet of defenders nice. without a dribble. His athleticism made him a weapon in transition as well, where he used his straight line speed to outrun slower, burlier centers of his time. It's less common today, but this penalized bigger lineups who crashed the glass. Nice. And it was normal for Robinson to outsprint opponents multiple times in a game like he did to Shaquille O'Neal in this 1996 matchup. Damn, yeah, they started out at the exact same spot. He got way ahead of Shaq there. David was one of the better lob threats of that era, a giant explosive target, and that's two-time Defensive Player of the Year, Alonzo Mourning. He just ragdolls. Damn. I do think he was a touch more fluid flowing into these in his first few seasons, but lobs were certainly part of his offensive package in those peak years. San Antonio started to unlock this talent in 1996 when they ran more side pick and rolls with Avery Johnson, who grew comfortable with these reads. And I think between his mid-range shooting and his finishing skills, Robinson would have made a wonderful partner for a high-level pick and roll guard. Instead, Fair enough. Imagine like a Jason Kidd and him or Stockton and him or Steve Nash and him. It would have been fun to see. Ed, he was asked to carry the entire offense in the mid-90s, which wasn't quite an ideal role. The Admiral was best suited to anchor a team's defense and play a hybrid role on offense, acting as a co-pilot or second-best offensive player. The exact role he would play after his peak when Tim Duncan arrived in 1998. Duncan shouldered a larger isolation load, while wow, the flexible wow, Robinson move. played largely the same style out of the high post. Robinson's off-ball skills allowed him to fit in well with another talent, where he could still co-anchor some of the offense, here drawing a double for a huge three in the title-clinching game in 1999. And he could mix in his own isolation scoring in more select doses. The result was a decrease in volume for Robinson with an increase in scoring efficiency, a slightly above average offense for the Spurs as a team, and more importantly, a dominant defense behind those twin towers. <laughs> the Spurs engineered arguably the greatest defensive stretch in league history, holding their playoff opponents about seven points per 100 below their regular season efficiency, a feat matched by only a few teams, and those teams had weaker regular season defenses. That's huge. Seven points below 100. So is that saying they hold their their the uh, the offensive team 7% lower average whenever they play the, the Spurs? That's damn good. While Duncan was a great defender out of the gate, it was Robinson's impact that led the Spurs on defense. Yep. And while many view Duncan as the clear alpha dog on those teams after 1998, Robinson wasn't far behind because of his two-way impact and ability to blend with Duncan on offense. Robinson was a good entry passer in the mid-90s, and his best passes were from the perimeter, where he could face up and survey the floor. In this position, his height allowed him to see the action unfold, and he could fire two cutters with decent speed, or he could feather in deliveries with a bit more touch. He was always a willing extra passer. In this 1993 play, he can see the court and quickly flips it to a high leverage spot. And by 1995, I thought he was better at processing cutting action in front of him. This is a really nice read here, quickly spotting that his cutter's defender goes behind another Laker in a kind of half-hearted tag and while there's no quick shot, it's the kind of pass that demonstrates some understanding of what defenses are doing, and it shows some anticipation. Although he wasn't elite in these spots, he misses the potential Draymond Green special here, and in my film study, I'm not sure he ball faked in a situation like this one time to manipulate the defense. 
Here's another one from the same game where he doesn't have time to really process the backside action and misses a potential layup. When he couldn't survey the floor, the results were choppier. He can't quickly process that the corner is open here. And with his head down, he desperately flails this to an outlet. With his back to the basket, as long as he could see that help coming from the top, his kickout passes were pretty solid. And this created plenty of open shots for the Spurs when they spaced the floor around him. Here he turns to spot the help, and in trying to locate his teammate, the delivery gets away from him a bit. Here's another one where he can't see the double coming, and his instinct is to turn and pass, but again, it's not the smoothest delivery, and it's deflected in front of his body. His lack of a handle and that lateral stiffness hurt him in these spots where well-timed double teams could prevent him from quickly moving it. And in this case, he's clamped up and misses another possible dab. Yeah, but I, I can't. I can't hold that against him. He's got zero vision. Still, I he think that high post extra passing prowess, along with his massive defensive impact, was the key to unlocking Robinson's value as a defensive superstar and offensive number two. From 1998 to 2000, Robinson logged 37 minutes per game in the playoffs, while Duncan played 41 minutes a game. When Robinson sat on the bench during those years, the Spurs were outscored by 16 points every 48 minutes. But when Robinson played, they were a whopping plus 11. And since we've been tracking this data since 1997, that is the largest change among any rotation player on record in the postseason. In the 98-99 playoffs, the Spurs were actually better in the limited minutes Duncan was on the bench. We're only talking about a few hundred minutes here, so there's plenty of noise. But this is a huge reminder of how impactful a hybrid player like Robinson can be without being the team's clear-cut number one scorer. This makes sense when we remember these were dominant defensive teams that were slightly above average on offense. It also brings us full circle back to Bill Russell, who, as we examined in the series Prelude, dominated the 60s without being his team's best offensive player. I wonder what Robinson's career would have looked like with another offensive star next to him, and furthermore, how would we view him if he was the one who joined a 32-year-old Duncan in 1998 and propelled the Spurs over the top, launching the Popovich era? Fair enough. Robinson was clearly a better offensive player than Russell, although despite that incredible speed off the floor and his considerable defensive impact, he wasn't entirely on Russ's level at that end. His reactions to threats were quite quick, especially if he could see the threat in front of him. Oh, good but Robinson could be a bit too stationary in subpar positions. He wasn't really down in his stance, pivoting around a lot like Bill Walton. But I think he didn't bounce around a lot because of his limitations moving laterally. His lateral movement wasn't really poor, but it was more laborious and stiffer, especially compared to his straight ahead quickness. And so he couldn't easily slide horizontally in the paint, which limited him compared to some of his normal straight line movement in help situations. Yeah, I'd be the same way at his height. <laughs> Just like we saw in his passing game, he wasn't great at mapping the court that he couldn't see, and sometimes that allowed breakdowns behind his field of vision. Pick and roll also wasn't a huge part of the game then, but Robinson's horizontal movement meant this wasn't really a defensive strength for him, and in general, he tried to avoid stretching to the perimeter. Still a strong offensive game and nearly goat defense Ooh. yields some massive overall impact. We have regular season plus minus data going back to 1994, and on a per game basis, Robinson looks like one of the best regular season players we've ever seen. Using our historical box score estimates, his playoff value during these peak seasons looks good, but not quite what we'd expect for a top 10 candidate. However, the Admiral moves up a rank when we use his numbers from 1998, and we know when we add in plus minus data for those years, he looked like a Titan. This reinforces what the box score can't capture, Robinson's combination of quality isolation scoring and off-ball offense, along with that massive defensive impact, make him one of the most valuable players of his era. 
His two-way skill set scales well on a variety of championship rosters, and as a result, there aren't five centers since the ABA merger who I think have peaked higher than David Robinson. I could agree with that. For more historical content and to support this channel, head over to patreon.com slash thinking basketball and check out thinking basketball the book on Amazon that goes deeper on a number of ideas explored in this series. There are also longer discussions on many of these players on the thinking basketball podcast. All right. That's going to do it on this one. You guys, uh, if you liked what you, uh, what you saw here, definitely go check out thinking basketball. Great channel. I, as you can tell, very informative and it's not just coming at like an entertainment level this is like straight up breaking down someone's game or in his other series a whole team or whatever the case may be david robinson's a tough one man because there was a time where i thought this might be like the, the greatest big man to ever play the game but injuries happened and he slowed down but looking at revisiting his peak for the first time since i was a kid like he was the real deal man you know, I used to always imagine what would what would it look like if Michael Jordan had a center like David Robinson to rely on down low. I think it would be absolutely game over. Nobody would have a shot against those that, that a duo like that. Same thing with Hakeem Olajuwon. I could say the same thing for both of those guys. But anyways, let me know what your thoughts are on uh, David Robinson. How do you think his peak uh, lines up with some of the other greatest big men of all time and their peak runs. Um, I think he's right up there. He's right up there. I'd say top five that I know of in their peak as far as big men go. It's just unfortunate his peak didn't last nearly long enough. All right, everyone. I hope you have a wonderful night. Uh, hope you have a peaceful night. And I hope it's not nearly as hot where you are as it is over here. Uh, please leave the video a like. Subscribe to the channel if you want more. If you do, I'll see you tomorrow morning for the next one. And as always, thank you very much. Be good to your people. Reach out to your loved ones. Let them know you love them. All right. Peace out, everyone.